Good morning, everybody. If you're able, why don't you stand? Welcome to Pathway. We're so glad that you're here. If you're out in the foyer, come on in. It's time to worship the Lord. This morning, we're going to start out our service by praying for another body of Christ in our community. And today, we're going to be praying for the Green Baptist Church. This church has been around since the 1700s, which blows me away. And they have a a really young pastor named Josh and his wife, Jess, and they have a young kid. And uh, they lead this church. They lead all the ministries. So let's pray for them. That can be really hard. So please join me if you would. Father God, thank you so much for this church and for the history and the so many years they've been faithful to you, Lord God. So right now, I just pray that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. As their service is ending right about now, I just pray that you'd fill Josh with the words to say. Thank you for his wife, Jess, and their their young child, Lord. Would you just continue to fill them with your spirit, but also restore them and keep them fresh. So thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in that church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we are now going to worship ourselves. We'll be doing communion in the midst of worship. So if you didn't grab one of those cups, you can feel so uh, feel free to do that now. And uh, let's pause, though, for a second. I've had a lot of coffee. Let's take a break. <laughs> let's breathe. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your presence. We pray, come, Holy Spirit. Oh, thank you for what you're doing here, Lord. We just say, come Holy Spirit, let's worship together in spirit and truth. Here we go. Search the world. And it couldn't fail me. The man's empty praise, the treasures that fade.
to the one who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ, the High King of heaven, my King for us. All praise. And all praise to the Lord Most High. All praise to the one who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ, the High King of heaven, my King forever. Let's give him a shout of praise, amen. I sing, I lift my hands up, right? I sing, I lift my hands up. You guys sing? And so what I want us to do is this. If this is something that we believe in our hearts, that we believe in our spirits, that we want to lay our lives down for the one who laid his life down, would you go ahead and would you raise your hands with me? There's nothing magic about our hands. This is just an outward expression of an inward grace.
as we prepare for communion, we are reflecting on the goodness of God. Communion started out as a simple meal between Jesus and his disciples to affirm who he was, that he really was who he said he was, and to tell them that he was about to pour out his love on them in a way that changes us even today. This Last Supper, this meal of communion is a symbol where Jesus was trying to tell his disciples as he's trying to tell us today that he loves us. That in spite of our brokenness, in spite of our weakness and our struggles, his love is continually poured out on us. That the chains in our lives can be broken because of the goodness and the love and the grace of God demonstrated in the cross. So as we peel back this first layer, Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and he passed it out as a meal to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. The disciples don't know what, about, what is about to happen. And I think today we're still grappling with the significance of what this cup means in our lives today. That as Jesus gives himself to us, we can step into the new life that he's offering us. So he took the cup, he gave it to his disciples and said, drink in remembrance of me. Let's continue to worship.
dear children. Thank you, God. When we sang in the goodness of God how he's running after us with his love and mercy. And I, I want, I was walking this morning and I felt God say that to me. And I don't know if you need to hear that too. He's running after you too still in grace and mercy, even though you, maybe you've been walking with him for 10 years or 20 years or 50 years. He's still wanting to love you. I hope, I hope you hear that today. Let's sing it one more time. In winter, I believe you. singing that my hope has come I noticed the smile just kind of like came to my face and I opened my eyes and I looked wow Matt's got a real big smile on his face and Brandon and Christian over here and I just see him all over the place and it's not because we're like happy it's because the joy of the Lord is upon us and if it's not in you right now I'm gonna pray so would the joy of the Lord fill this place come Holy Spirit God no matter what we're going through let us feel the joy of the Lord right now on each and every one of us. Fill us afresh, Lord God. We pray, thank you for your love and that you are with us. We love you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh, it's good. Well, please be seated if you're not already. Great to have you here. Um, again, my name is Seth. I'm one of the pastors here. Our senior pastor, Alan, is away this week on vacation. His second week, he'll be back with us uh, on Tuesday and, and here again on Sunday. Um, this morning, our, our young ladies group is leaving to go to Awaken. I think there's 32 young women, which is awesome. So I encourage you, keep them in your prayers as they go. They're going to be learning all about the grace of God over these next couple days. Uh, this week, we got a lot of events coming up. Season Saints and Baptisms is next Sunday. If you're not signed up and you've never been baptized, consider it. Jeremy's going to tell you all about it in the announcements. Or Jenny, I can't remember who says it, but uh, a lot of good stuff. So... This week, uh, if you came with a tithe or an offering that you'd like to give, you can do that on your way out. You can do it on Pushpay, on the church's website, all kinds of different ways. Uh, let me just pray a prayer of blessing over that. So God, thank you so much again for this day, for this church, for everybody here. Lord, would you just bless all that's given in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And with that, let's see what Jeremy does have to say in the announcements. and welcome to Pathway. We're glad you're here. My name is Jeremy. I'm on staff here at Pathway. And if you're new here, we would love to connect with you. If you're tech savvy, you can scan this QR code with a smartphone camera and fill out that connect card right from your phone. If you prefer paper and pen, we have connect cards right at the info booth. Regardless of which way you'd like to connect with us, come to the info booth after the service. We would love to meet you and to give you a gift just to say thank you for checking us out today. Please be praying for our teen girls this week as they head off to Awaken, a retreat for middle and high school girls. However, it's not too late to get your boys signed up for Heroes, our teen guides retreat, happening August 14th through the 16th. This is the last week to sign up, so make sure you register them in the Church Center app or on our website as soon as possible. We love to celebrate milestones here at Pathway. On August 14th, we're having a sixth grade step up during our second service. We're thrilled to be praying for and blessing our incoming sixth graders as they start their journey in youth ministry. If you have a sixth grader, make sure you sign them up in the Church Center app today. Hi, I'm Jenny. On August 14th, after the sixth grade step up, we'll be gathering on the hill for a baptism and a barbecue right after our second service. Baptisms are a powerful way for us to express our love for God and to declare our commitment to follow Jesus. If you're considering being baptized, join Seth 
on Wednesday night, August 10th at 6 p.m. for our baptism class. And make sure you sign up in the Church Center app or on our website. And finally, a correction from last week is the real date for the youth orientation is August 17th at 6 p.m. So if you have a new sixth grader or a teenager who's new to youth group, this event is for you. So bring the entire family for dinner as you meet our youth pastors, Teresa and Bill and their team. You'll get to ask some questions, learn about youth programs and play some games with the teens. Your kid will get to meet other teens, have fun and see what youth group is all about. Make sure you register online on the Church Center app or on our website so that we know you're coming. And for our final segment, did you know that August is Maine's favorite month? Not only does August share its name with our state capital, but it's the best time to enjoy the outdoors. Our lakes are warmer. You can pick your own berries and the humidity, it's not so bad. So if you would all stand and turn to someone near you and ask them how many Augusts they've been at Pathway. And as always, we hope you feel welcomed and loved here at Pathway. of Pathway, which is all about telling God's story, the story of God, who he is and what he has done in and through our lives. Now, last week, Phil Strout, who is such a gifted storyteller, isn't he? He explained how on February 11th, 1974, Jesus accepted him into God's story. And since that day, which is now over 48 years ago, Phil has been on a journey with God in which he has been transformed from the punk kid he was in Mechanic Falls growing up to the man of God who spoke here last week. And I, for one, think it's pretty safe to say that by living out his life in obedience to Christ, he has become an example of someone that we would say has lived a life of fruitful longevity. Now today, I have with me Another faithful man of God who has also lived a life of fruitful longevity, and his name is Steve Shaw. If you want to welcome Steve, let's, uh, you know. <laughs> and in just a minute, he's going to tell us his story. But before he does, I feel like there's something that I need to say to him, to, to myself, to all of us, um, in regards to something Alan kicked this sermon series off with, which is each of us. Each and every one of us, we all have a story to tell. It's a story worth telling. But don't bother comparing your story to Phil's 
or to Steve's or to mine or to Alan's or to the lady sitting next to you because your story matters because you matter. Each of us are unique and each of our stories are unique. And your story also reveals God within it. So when you tell it, healing is possible. Healing can follow you or it can be for those who are listening. All right, so let's hear Steve's story. Steve, you want to start us off? Like, wh where are you from? Where'd you grow sure. up? Well, good morning. Uh, I'm from away, so that's how my story starts. I was born in Connecticut and uh, lived there for my first 13 years, but my parents were uh, from the Rumford, Mexico area, so the, that's the connection with Maine for me, and uh, I know that's not good enough for full citizenship as a Mainer, but uh, that's right. it's, it's pretty good. Uh, they had moved to Connecticut in 1956 because of the incredible work opportunities down there. A lot of people migrated uh, down that way from my family. But uh, actually, some of my earliest memories of, of being just a little one uh, have to do with uh, going to church. Uh, my folks were a member of the Stratford Baptist Church in Connecticut, and uh, uh, we would go there every Sunday. My dad was uh, quite involved with that church. Uh, when I was, uh, let's see, 12 years old in 1969, my dad was taking uh, some friends with him, and I got invited, probably by the ear, to, uh, to go with them. And we were going to see Billy Graham at Madison Square Garden. And it turns out that that was the moment in time, as a 12-year-old, that the story of the good news uh, connected with me. And that's when I accepted Christ or Christ accepted me into his story. So uh, 1970, August of 1970, my father moved the family from Connecticut to Rumford. And uh, but at, at this time, he'd also become a pastor and had his own church, Church of Good News. Some of you, I see some of you uh, older ones in the crowd remember that church. And uh, so we, we were uh, going to that. I, I couldn't get away from it. It was like... That's what I did. Church was life. But I'll tell you what, somebody, some of these people must have known something about me that I wasn't really tracking with uh, because I can't tell you how many times somebody would come and get me in the middle of a church service and try to haul me down to the altar to get saved. I got saved <laughs> dozens and dozens of times in that church growing up. And uh, it, uh, <laughs> it took time, but uh, I'm, I'm here today anyway. I think it's working now. But anyway, in my uh, late teens, early 20s, I was still attending church. But by the time I reached my early 20s and the uh, mid-20s and the 80s, early 80s, the currents of soul drift were moving quickly. And a soul that is, has been separated from its anchor is more than likely going to head for the rocks. And so I walked away from church and stayed adrift spiritually for the next 10 years. My mid-20s were were pretty self-destructive. And so I, I bring you to a place in, in my life that uh, I, I, until first service this morning, I've never talked about publicly. And uh, it just, it, it's just one of those things that for me has been, been a process that God has been working at in my life. But I say this for a reason, and we're going to come back to it as well. But here's the thing. When you blow up a bomb that's called infidelity, it creates an enormous amount of damage in family. And I set off the bomb. It was my infidelity. Much of the damage is immediately obvious. Some of it isn't. Some of the damage in time gets better. Some of it doesn't. But what you don't realize until later is that as you were the one standing on top of the bomb, that the damage you caused to yourself isn't obvious for quite some time. And we'll get back to this, but uh, at that moment in my life, I'd gotten divorced, and uh, church was a long way behind me in the rearview mirror. But, you know, every once in a while, in that rearview mirror, God would show up, and I could see that he was still there. Uh, I ended up joining the military, had gotten married again, and towards the end of those 10 years, I, I was thinking about trying to reconnect spiritually in some way, but it seemed like it was such a long swim for shore. And uh, uh, at this time, we were living back in this area, 
And so I was trying different churches, and it just nothing, nothing was really causing me to feel like my feet were on solid ground. And uh, so kept doing my thing, so nothing was really changing. Uh, I had moved to this area because I'd gotten work at Bath Iron Works in 1988. And so we'd moved to Lewiston to make the commute a little more tolerable uh, than, than uh, it had been. Uh, and actually retired from there back, uh, this past November. So that's, uh, that's been a good change in season. But then one night, a Saturday night in 1993, it was a January, I was on my way taking a ride up to Rumford from, from down here, uh, just going to go run some of the bars up there. And so I was driving by myself. I had some beers with me in the car, and uh, I was coming up to Canton on Route 108, if you're not familiar with that ride up there, and uh, opened a, a beer, brought it up to my mouth, and in my head, it wasn't an audible voice, but in my head, there was a voice that said, how much longer am I going to struggle with you with this? So, the smart thing to do was put the beer down in the console and let that thing settle down. So I did that, drove a little bit further, Lifted up the beer to have a, have a drink, and the same words, the same voice. How much longer am I going to deal with you with this? So I realized that I need to, I need to attend to this voice. Put the beer down. Went on a back road and just began a conversation with God. And uh, back and forth, just back and forth. But the different thing here was that I came to a point where I said, God, if you'll help me with this, I'll turn around go home, and I'll go to church tomorrow. And so I did that, threw the beer out, and went home, got up in the morning, and I went to a church called Vineyard Christian Fellowship. You probably have heard of that. That was uh, almost 30 years ago that I showed up at the vineyard. And uh, I'll tell you, it was a fresh start with God. It was a fresh connection with friends and family who could help me in that journey. And I immediately, I showed up on a Sunday, and that Thursday I was attending a life group because I knew uh, I needed to be connected. That whole thing about having an anchor that gets, that, a soul that gets loose from the anchor, part of getting back to that anchor was going to be done through small groups, and I, and I understood that. So small groups really was, played a big role. Um, but for my wife, it would about be about three months before she uh, began to come. She had to just kind of work this out for herself, and she noticed that my life was beginning to change in a you know much better way. And so one Sunday, she said, "Hey, can I go to church with you today?" And so, sure, absolutely. So uh, both of us, we've been here for th almost 30 years, like I said, and uh, I can't tell you what this community of faith means to us the impact that it's had on our lives over the years, to have a place to worship, to have a place where you can go, people pray for you, to have uh, coffee with friends and know that you can talk about things and, and still be safe. This church has really uh, given us our life back. And then um, over time, we started becoming involved with different ministries, different, you know, children's ministry or this or that, just serving in ways that we could fit in, building long-lasting friendships, and we uh, began to grow in leadership opportunities of just, just helping out in different ways. But here's the thing. In the middle of my spiritual recovery, one of the most difficult things I was left with to, to, to deal still with in those days was the whisper that would come to me that after all I had done, after my infidelity, after the damage I had caused to others, all the crazy things along the way, how could God ever consider, how could I ever consider myself as being someone that God would want to use? I was accepted into the family of God, but was I usable to him? You see, the word disqualified often would be sounding in my thoughts. Maybe I should just sit in the back, be quiet, just be happy that God's let me back in the door. The story of the prodigal son in Luke 15 had taken a new meaning on to me, uh, the, the acceptance back, but I wasn't doing so well with, the accepting, with accepting the goodness, the gifts of God that he wanted to give to me. It took me a long time to open the grip of my hands on the feelings of unworthiness. It took time to accept his acceptance of me and his goodness to me that comes with it. 
but with the prayers of friends, I began to understand that my past is not stronger than the power of Jesus' work on the cross. It's easy to think that our particular sins are the exception. Not only are our sins forgiven, but Jesus also wants to remove the guilt, the shame, our sense of unworthiness, because he knows how paralyzing it is to our soul. It's all part of what it is to be a new creature, new creature in Christ. Sometimes the old voices want to come back, but there's a louder voice that speaks to me now. Amen. And he reminds me of who I am. Healing is, healing from our past is a process in our life. Yes, and I want to just take a second. We've just heard that last part, and I think it's really powerful. And so there's a saying, it's like, you hear it once for your head, now I want you to listen with your heart. So what Steve was saying is, our pasts are not stronger than the power of Jesus' work on the cross. It's easy to think that our particular sin is one that we're struggling with, that's the exception. But the truth is, each and every one of our sins are forgiven. And in addition to that, Jesus also wants to remove our guilt our sense of unworthiness, and our shame. It's all a part of becoming a new creation in him. Now, sometimes the old voices, they want to be heard, but there's a louder voice called the Holy Spirit. That's the one to listen to. That's the one that's going to drown those out. Healing from our past is a process, and may I add that it's best done together. Go ahead. Well, in our journey with the vineyard, after a period of some intentional training, my wife and I set out to plant a uh, vineyard church down. And we, we enjoyed this experience so much. It's like, man, other people need to experience this. And so it just kind of became a, a thing that I, I want to go do this. I want to be a church planter. So um, we went down to the coast with some friends, uh, Bob and B. Nesbitt. Some of you may still remember them. Um, we moved to Edgecombe in August of 1999. And in the following spring, began meeting at an elementary school. And uh, I'm going to make a long story short here. We started with a small gathering of families. We grew. We had a wonderful uh, group of people to, to uh, do this with. We met lots of remarkable people. Saw God do a lot of great things in the lives of, of uh, the group. And uh, we met for 10 years at an elementary school. Set up, tear down, set up, tear down. So this place is great. Yes. Just walk right in. Some of our friends were there, uh, Adam and Beth Hansen. They're on the worship teams. They're back there. They were part of our crew down there at uh, Midcoast Vineyard. And uh, long story short, it just wasn't meant to be. It, it didn't happen. We gave it our best for 10 years. And uh, at some point, it's like, okay, I get it. We're going to have to do something different. So we did end up closing in uh, 2010, I believe. Yeah, May of 2010. And uh, hard to say goodbye, but, you know, we, we just uh, moved on. And so we ended up coming back here in uh, actually May of 2010. Um, and so it was uh, the only thing that I could do. I will say this. After those 10 years, uh, on our last Sunday that we we're going to meet, uh, I, I just said to God, I said, I'm not sure how you see all this, but I give you these, I give you these last 10 years. Just take it. And that you would, I mean, we left an incredible amount of prayers down there in the mid coast, mm. prayer walks and different things that we were doing and praying for the community. They're still there. I believe they're still there. Our prayers are still there going into the heavens that God will someday move down there. So we find ourselves back here 11 years later at Pathway. And uh, it was kind of a challenge for my wife and I because a lot of our friends had moved. When we came back to this church, there were about 250 people. I mean, no, when we left the church, there were about 250 people. And uh, back in 99, when we come back to the church, there's like 900 or more. Phil reminded me that they were doing four Sunday services a day. And it was just all kinds of new faces. And so my wife and I were the new faces in our old church. And it's like, oh. How do, you, uh, how do you, so, but we were welcomed by Phil and the staff and we certainly appreciated the opportunity to be refreshed, make new friendships and, and the grace that was given to us here. Hmm. 
Well, I want to press you on that a little bit because when you, so when you make that move and you come back to these packed out pathway church services full of all these people that you don't know because all your friends have moved on, after you'd spent that decade pastoring this church, building life groups, connecting with people only to have to close the doors, like I know that that was a challenging time for you. How did you persevere through that? How did you take those next steps and stay grounded like, were you in the Word? Was there somebody in the Bible that maybe you connected with? What, what did you do? Well, when you go back to uh, my story, the beginning of my story here at Vineyard, I came on a Sunday. I was in a life group on Thursday. And so that was key for us to reconnect with this community that was, was enormous, was getting back involved with life groups. Life groups is, uh, yeah, there's the doorways to this Sunday service, but life groups is really the, the doorway into relationship, into, into community in this church. And so that was the, the, the most important thing, I think, that we took with us. Uh, as far as uh, connecting in, with, a, with a character in the Bible uh, that helps me, it would be the Apostle John. And not so much, and when I'm talking from the book of Revelation part, uh, not so much of where John found himself, the circumstances that he found himself in, but the experience that he had and his encounter with Jesus. Because John was in crisis right there. He was, in, he was in exile on the island of Patmos. He was alone. He was... You know, he, he had no connection to the seven churches that he had oversight with. He had no connection to friends. And it seemed like it was Rome that was now going to determine his future, that he was going to be locked down in this island, never to be of really any use in the kingdom of God again. But something happens. The apostle John has a fresh encounter with his friend, his savior, and his king. When you read those first few, that first chapter he realizes that Jesus is still present. He realizes that Jesus still has a plan. He realizes that God is still up to something. And in that encounter that he has, he then is given a new vision, a new charge, a fresh word from Jesus for each of the seven churches that he had oversight with. And it was a powerful reminder for John that Rome was not the one who would determine his future. It was Jesus who would determine that future. But here's a specific thing I, that I want you to hear about fruitful longevity. And as I do, it's not, it's not that I'm, we're, we're going to shift to a Bible study now. I'm continuing to tell you my story. You see, fruitful longevity isn't about how many ministries I've run or how involved I am with ministries or if I'm going to do minist be in ministry till my wheels fall off. Fruitful longevity is much more a personal issue than that. The question then becomes about how well are we keeping our souls? How well are we connected moment by moment by moment to Jesus? How well are we giving ourselves to him? Are we still excited to be in connection with Jesus? Are, are our lives spilling over from his life onto the lives of people around us? Are you still encountering him? Now, here's the verse. This verse really sets it. If you're looking for spiritual, uh, for, for uh, fruitful longevity in your life, this is the verse. Remain in me, and I'll remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. That is the secret. It's not about someday when you get old, it's not about some day when you get a ministry. It's about this. And this can happen in a moment. An encounter with Jesus. Author David Benner writes something that helps here. He writes this. Jesus' call to each of us is to be aware of his presence, to turn towards him and surrender to his love. This is the call he offers me each and every day of my life. My response is never once for all. As Anthony of the desert said, every morning I must say again to myself, today I start. Mm. That's good. But I do want to bring you back to John. 
and the crisis that he was in and what's going on in your life. How do those two connect with fruitful longevity? Yes, I connect with uh, that because of eight years ago, I myself was in a, in a challenge. Uh, I, I had nothing to do with exile or anything like that. But uh, for me, um, when I get uh, health issues, it'll put me into an anxiety. And uh, I'm getting better at it, though. He's helping me along the way. <laughs> We're helping but each other. I'm getting other. better at it because the thing is I don't communicate. When I'm feeling something going on, I keep it to myself. It just percolates, and it's like it takes your breath away. If you've experienced that, you know what I'm talking about. It's just one day after another. It builds and builds and builds. And I felt like I was just in this deep crisis. And so I remembered that uh, when I'm in crisis, to keep my eyes open for God, for what he's doing in that crisis, because he is there. And so in this whole process of time, in the beginning of January uh, 2015, um, God began to show me day by day how deeply and unconditionally loved I am by him. And it has been the, the discovery that has had the power to change my life where those attempts at change have never been able to succeed. Encountering the deep, unflinching, never dimming love of God has that kind of effect on us. But now I was beginning, beginning to experience this love for myself. I'd been a pastor for 10 years. I loved, you know, when I read, I love ideas. It's like, oh, this is, this is so written so well. I like how he's saying that. You know, and it just fills my head. And one day Jesus came and just pulled that little thing where everything in my head fell into my heart and I began to experience his love for me in a radical way that has changed my life. Nothing has been the same ever since. That, you know, you can't compare what John saw in his, in his vision and revelation, but for me, this has been life-changing to, to experience the love of God, the things in my past about being an unfaithful divorcee, about not having succeeded in the, uh, being a church planter, that's not what defines me. Just as the Apostle John's life and future was not defined by Rome or an empire, or emperor rather, or exile, my life, my future is not defined by my past. People may still want to do that, but God has redefined me. And I agree with what God says. But encountering God and his deep love for you, when that settles down into your soul, it changes everything. It changes the way you see other people. It changes the way you see your church, the way you read your read scriptures. It changes the way you view nature. But the most important thing of all is when you experience the love of God, it begins to change the way you see yourself. And that is where the enemy lies in keeping us blind to the value that God has for us. To, I mean, we are the object of his affection. He moves heaven and earth because of the depth of his love for us that his son would go and die on the cross just so we could look him in the eye. The deep love of God changes us. John's encounter changed everything with him. And this is where fruitful longevity rests in all of us. In my life, fruitful longevity hasn't happened because of the strength of personality, the strength of uh, my willpower or brilliance of a vision or an idea. As Phil said last week, Jesus accepted him. Jesus brought Phil into his story. Fruitful longevity is a continual, continuing journey of our life in Jesus' story. That's what Jesus is telling us in John 15. That's the invitation. Jesus is one of the most <laughs> invitational people you'll come across. And he does this in John 15. It has everything to do with our continuing connection with Jesus, his life flowing into ours. I mean, there was no stopping his grace, his mercy, his goodness, his, his kindness from flowing out into the lives of people. And when we're, our life is connected like a branch to the vine, we'll find his goodness flowing through us. And it won't be stoppable. Fruitful longevity is seen in people who live orientated towards a life rich in love, joy, peace, patience, 
kindness, goodness, fruitfulness, self-control, day after day, month after month, and year after year. But some of you may say, yeah, that's, that's the simple version. I know. I'm ready to do the big stuff. Well, fantastic. I'm glad that you're ready to do the big stuff. But live your life orientated towards this. Being continually connected to Jesus is the big stuff. That's the call on your life. Before anything else, the call on your life, your identity as a human being is the love of Jesus, is the connection that he has between you. And out of that place, we'll see what happens. Big things don't happen from our enthusiasm, our willpower, or our good intentions. Here's the reality of Christian life. Most often, for myself, for many people that I know, what we experience are the little things. The little things that happen and happen and happen year after year after year. Loving our family. Loving our neighbor. Kindnesses given to others. Words spoken of graciousness. Forgiveness given away. Those little things mount up to a fruitful longevity in your life. If you're constantly wondering what God wants you to do, to be doing in this world, consider this. Establishing fruitful longevity isn't so much about what you're doing, first and foremost. It's about who you are becoming as you live your life, your life always open to a new encounter with God. When we live our life out of who we're coming in Christ, this will lead to fruitful longevity in our life. Well, as we wrap this up, I have a bit of a, a loaded question for you. So earlier this morning, you mentioned that you asked God to be your Savior in 1969. Phil mentioned last week, you know, that happened for him in 1974. I myself asked, you know, confessed with my mouth that Jesus is Lord in 1982, which means that we've been a part of God's story for a very long time. But when you consider our church and when you consider that there's some who haven't yet begun that journey or, you know, there's some who just last week, like a young man named Nathaniel who came forward July 31st, 2022, with the biggest smile and brightest eyes I've seen in a long time. He walks up and he says, I just accepted Jesus as my Savior. You're speaking to all of us. How do we, from the, you know, the seasoned saints who have been doing this for decades to the new little crumb crunchers who've been doing this for 10 minutes, like, how do we all have a fresh encounter with God? Okay, yeah. Uh, here's some things that you could do. Now, uh, expand. When I say expand, I'm not telling you to pray longer. Just saying to re-look re at your, how you pray. In expanding your prayer, take some time to listen. Listen. Because these are where the encounters with God happen, in the listening. God knows everything we need. So he's already aware of everything that we want to pray. But we're not aware of what he wants to say. And so in your, in your prayer time, excuse me, in your prayer time, take the time to be listening to what God may want to say to you. The second thing is to expand your worship. Expand your worship. You enjoy what happened this morning? That was an encounter with God. And we can do that in the week. We can do that driving in our car. We can do that just, you know, doing our chores at work, wherever we are. Work at expanding your worship because we encounter God in worship. And the third thing is to expand how you read, the, read your scriptures. Um, take a look again at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And just spend some time and ask the Lord to help you to enter into those scriptures. So that, you know, don't be in a hurry to catch up because your program, you're three months behind on the reading program, you know, and you got to just buzz through. But take the time with maybe three, four verses in the story of Jesus where he's in a crowd. Become part of the crowd. Let him turn his gaze till it sets on you. Hear what he wants to say to you in the middle of what he's doing. This will be an encounter with God in the middle of your scripture. So those three things are what I would recommend. The, the, um, one other thing that I'd like to give you 
is a place to begin to expand your listening prayer. In Ephesians 3, 17 through 19, this is a prayer from Paul. It's the most powerful prayer that you can pray for yourself because it's all about encounter. It's all about encounter. And when you get to the end of praying this prayer and, and saying these words, listen. Listen to what God wants to say. Here's the words. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, you're already there. You just don't fully realize it. That's why he's praying this prayer. May have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, that you may know this love that surpasses knowledge. See, we need the gift of the Holy Spirit to open our mind to transition from the human, the broken human love that we know and experience and give and receive to this holy love that is beyond what we can comprehend. Do this. Pray this prayer over and over and over again. It's an encounter with God every time. Okay. All right. Let's stand. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for being willing to share your story with us. If those who um, are here to pray at the end of our service would come forward. And I actually think you have something you want to uh, lead us in. Yes, yeah. Um, you know, um, like I mentioned, I, I had never uh, publicly told of that part of my story. But I have found even in the preparation preparation for today God is still working in me and healing me and moving me along and, and uh, but it's a common thing I think that we, we do dealing with this but for those who are having a hard time moving beyond events in your past, your past seems to define you in spite of your faith in Christ let Jesus help you move into your truest identity as a son daughter of God who is deeply loved, fully forgiven, and released from guilt and shame. There may be some here that are still tangled up pretty hard, just can't get past it, that everything, when everything goes quiet around you, you're still dealing with guilt, with shame. And God wants to bring freedom to you in that. And so I'm going to ask everybody just to bow their heads. And I'm going to pray a prayer. If this is you, you don't have to do anything but listen. And then I just want you to agree with this prayer if it's you. God, I want to begin the journey out of the dark and into the light of your grace. I'm tired of the guilt and shame I've carried with me. I want to leave it all now at the foot of the cross. I accept the freedom that Jesus extends to me right now. Holy Spirit, be my strength as I walk out of the old and into freedom. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I hope some of you prayed that prayer today. I hope some of you, today is the day that you begin to, to share your story to somebody who you can safely do that with. Allow the light of God to come into your life in those areas. It's a process, but stick with it. But he, because he will bring you to freedom. The other thing I'd like to offer for uh, ministry is for those who want God, His Spirit, to come and help them expand their prayer life, their worship life, and their reading life. That God would just come and do that. That each one of those three places would be encounters with you because those encounters lead to remaining connected to the vine. And in the connection to the vine is the fruitfulness. God's fruit will begin to come through your life those two things. If you'd like prayer, if you prayed that prayer with me and you want some more prayer with somebody, feel free to come down. If you want the help with, in, in the, with the Holy Spirit, with uh, expanding those three things, come down and get prayer. If you're not feeling well or you just want prayer for a friend or yourself, feel free to come. All right. Father God, we, uh, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for Steve and for his word. And that, God, I thank you that you are a chain breaker and that you're gonna set people free today from their past. Come Holy Spirit right now, begin to work. Don't let anybody leave without doing work with you, Lord God. 
Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for each person here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Come and get some prayer if you'd like. Look forward to seeing you next week for baptisms.